Okay, good afternoon everyone. Um, as you look at your program, I am not Jim Westmoreland. Um, Jim is actually on his way from Greensboro. He got delayed a little bit, so um, without further ado, we're going to start our program for the Transportation Founders Fund speaker series. Uh, we're delighted to have Carl Wunderlich here from Nobles, who's going to be our keynote speaker. Uh, so the program is fairly simple. We're going to start uh, with, with, this, with the talk. Uh, Carl would like to take a lot of questions. This is a hot topic, uh, an important topic, a timely topic. So we'd like you, this is really for you also to be engaged with the speaker. Uh, before we get started, I would like to uh, introduce Dr. Maladin Volk, uh, who is the Interim Vice Chancellor for Research. Um, what else? O R I E D innovation. for Research, Innovation, and Economic Development. He will say a few words on behalf of the university. Love. Thank you. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. It's a pleasure and a privilege to have this opportunity. Um, I have I have known of it ever since I came to NC State, and it's really a wonderful opportunity for me to say um, to you some of the very nice things I think about it. Uh, NC State, as you know very well, is one of its components <laughs> is outreach and, and engagement, and then another one is uh, education, of course, and another one is research. And as a university, we have a pretty good record in terms of research, for instance. Uh, the, the 2014 numbers are that our total research expenditures are in the range of 446 million, and they put us pretty high up in the, in the scheme of things. Um, and we have really good record when it comes to innovation, uh, things like patents, for instance, or disclosures. Uh, by <clears throat> practically all numbers, we are in the 7 to 10 uh, range when compared to uh, pretty much all the universities uh, in terms of these innovation related and, and startup related numbers. And we have, we are very high up there in terms of, in fact, again, top 10 or so in terms of industrial fund. Uh, and so having institutes like ITRI that really spans all the way from research to practical things to to really what matters out there in the field is extremely important for us. It's, it's a flagship uh, center. It's been around for a long, long time. Like it tells me, 1976, 78, 78. 78. <laughs> and uh, when I was engaged um, some number of years with ITRI, uh, it was mostly on the distance education side and, and delivery of that. But my experience was tremendous. I, uh, very, very capable people, very capable um, uh, programs. And today, if you look at what ITRI does, it's, I was um, at a board meeting earlier today, it really spans a huge range of interesting things that have to do with transportation. From UASs, right, the latest and the greatest in that space, all the way to intelligent vehicles and, and next generation to actually planning for schools, planning how to, uh, how to put children into different schools and keep a balance and so on. So really the range of activities is, is tremendous and really is <coughs> impressive. So all I can say is of course, this would not happen if you didn't have a tremendous director, <coughs> which I'm very proud of, and if you didn't have tremendous staff. And, and researchers. So uh, thank you on behalf of NC State. Thank you for being here. And um, let, let me uh, wish you a pleasant rest of the evening. Uh, and I do apologize in advance. I'm going to have to slip out. I have another event I have to go to. So thank you again. Thank you, Martin. OK. So we are going to move on to the program. Um, today's uh, 
topic is kind of, uh, Carl has put a very interesting twist on the title, Connected Everything. How connected vehicle, active infrastructure, and empowered travelers are transforming how we understand and manage surface transportation systems. Uh, Carl uh, Wunderlich, uh, I've known him for a while. Um, we were involved together in a program called NGSIM, Next Generation Simulation, many, many years ago. So it's good to have you here in Raleigh and appreciate you traveling from DC uh, to be here with us. Uh, so Carl is a transportation, uh, anal in the analysis, transportation analysis at Nobles and serves as a project manager and senior advisor on multiple federal research efforts to, to integrate technology into surface transportation systems. Uh, he's made notable contribution on traveler information system and on the use of simulation methods to predict and describe system. Uh, he holds a PhD in operation research from the University of Michigan. I was going to uh, skip that last sentence. A call may not know I am a graduate of the Ohio State University. <laughs> <laughs> so without further ado, Carl Wunder. Thanks, Nagy. I think that uh, University of Michigan thing either works in my favor or about 5% of the time. And then doesn't work in my favor <laughs> the rest of the time. So, uh, but you can't, you can't go back and change the past. So thank you, everybody. Uh, uh, it's great to be here in North Carolina. I have been here uh, on the campus before, uh, but it was about 15 years ago, and it was in the swim meet. So I've never been here, actually, uh, in an academic or as a, as a consultant. I was here as an athlete uh, years ago. Um, as, as Nagi pointed out, uh, I am a creature from inside the Beltway in Washington, D.C. Um, I have lived uh, in the capital area for about 25 years now. And uh, my job, as, as Nagy pointed out, is to help uh, the Federal Highway Administration and the USDOT uh, help them make better decisions about the guidance they provide about the technologies that are on the, uh, on the forefront. So I, I am sort of in the, in the job of helping them uh, let's scan the horizon for, for stuff that may change things. Uh, and I'm going to talk to you today about a couple of things that I think uh, may be interesting uh, for folks who, if you, if you drive a car, if you have a cell phone, if you ride transit, uh, I think that the world around you is going to change uh, pretty rapidly in the next uh, five years. So I'm going to talk about that. Uh, with that, maybe I'll try and get my slides to come up. Here we go. Um, well, before I go on to the first slide, <laughs> so when you're a technology guy or somebody thinks you're a technology guy, you oftentimes get asked questions about how new stuff works. And what I keep, what I keep coming back to is a really interesting exercise. If you, it's an exercise I recommend that if you have uh, students or if you're just sitting around the, uh, the kitchen table with your family. Uh, it's an exercise that, that we run. Uh, it's been done many places where you have two, ball, uh, two uh, bowls with, um, with slips of paper in them. The first thing, you pull out some fancy new technology that has to be explained. And the second bowl contains a list of names, historical figures. And the object is to get somebody else in the room to identify what that technology is by explaining it in terms that the historical figure would understand. So you pull Julius Caesar out of there and you're trying to explain connected vehicles. He doesn't know anything about cars, electricity. So it becomes very interesting in trying to find the language that describes what that technology is and whether that technology is good inherently, bad inherently, or has a balance of both. And typically what happens in these kinds of situations is that you find very rapidly what the underlying notion <coughs> of, the, uh, of the person who's describing it, whether they feel like it's a dangerous technology or of uh, a, a transformative technology. Very few people are able to provide a balanced presentation of what that technology might do off the cuff without resorting to, to jargon, to, to an uninformed audience. So we'll see how well I do here. I do get a fair amount of practice with this because my father is 90. Uh, and I get a lot of questions on the phone about what's going on with his computer and what is wrong with various things uh, that he can't understand and can't operate. And so I have to explain to him. Uh, most recently, uh, he heard all about my, find my iPhone, which I think he thought was a good thing. But he was also afraid that it was allowed someone else to find him and his iPhone, not for him to find his lost iPhone. So I had to very sort of carefully walk through that to say, 
no, it's not the government trying to find you in your phone. It's when you lose your phone, you can find it. And it was a little bit like uh, explaining uh, uh, like a, how a magic trick works to him to kind of go through what a GPS uh, system was, what a cloud computing might look like, uh, how the signals might go, how the police might be alerted. Uh, it took me about 25 minutes to explain it to him. And at the end of it, he says, so the government can figure out where I am? So, so, so this is kind of a, it's kind of a long-winded explanation, but I, but I think this is an excellent exercise in doing these kinds of things because we have to sort of carefully talk about technology in ways that doesn't push people one way or the other about making, because some people are immediately think that uh, new technology will do nothing but transform the world in positive ways. And other people think that the new technology only represents a threat. And the reality, of course, is it's somewhere in between. So I'm gonna talk a little bit today about some work that we've been doing uh, at the USDOT, in support of the USDOT research effort, uh, regarding connected vehicles. So connected vehicles, essentially wirelessly connected vehicles. Uh, they can send a lot of messages back and forth. Uh, mobile devices is another example of that, and roadside infrastructure uh, that is smart and empowering uh, and can send different kinds of messages. They're all part of this world. So in a nutshell, so if you do have to leave, here's my talk in one slide. <laughs> This is the, this is the executive summary. So there are lots and lots of things that are going to talk to each other and to uh, various uh, to each other and send out messages, right? And that list just keeps growing and growing and growing. So one of the issues is if everybody's talking at once randomly with no information, right? It's just a cacophony. Or can we manage this system or put in simple rules that makes all this data generation and transmission actually do something good? And on the flip side, if it's just a cacophony, but in the end it allows some bad actor to exploit the system, that's the worst, right? So, so I'm gonna talk a little bit about the, all these things that are about to be connected, how that affects the, the surface transportation system. But then I'm gonna take it in sort of a slightly different direction to say, one of, I think, the really good things, one of the good things about having a lot of these things connected is it allows us to change our perception of what the system actually does, why we have it, and what, we, what it produces. And, uh, and hopefully this won't be too strange, but the, the point is that we, we have the tra surface transfer system to do something, and that something is to move people and goods around, right? But as we'll see, the language, the language used to describe surface transportation systems historically has not focused on that. We don't, and in fact, I'll show you some examples from legislatures and other things that, that t the, the language is very different. So hopefully we can change that. I think these new data will, will be able to change the language that we use to describe the system in a way that I think is more balanced and focuses on the positive product of the system, not just the negative byproduct. The third thing is sort of a, as an, is an implication of inviting many connected elements into a system. So when you connect to a system, the system user becomes essentially part of the system itself and perceives themselves potentially as part of the system management. So I'll talk a little bit about the rise of the mobility consumer, which we absolutely positively see in Washington, D.C. in some areas, and what that implies for anybody who studies, manages, or otherwise interacts uh, with uh, or funds uh, surface transportation. And then last, I've got you know, a couple of quick items about simple things, I think, simple language-oriented things that people can do that can help them thrive in this connected everything transportation system, this new world that's emerging. All right, so if I was giving an Internet of Things talk, I would talk to this slide for 25 minutes, um, but I won't. Uh, it's not an Internet of Things talk. I'm, gonna get, I'm sure your next speaker is going to talk about the Internet of Things. So there, by 2020, there are going to be between 50 to 100 billion things connected to the Internet. What do I mean by things? Well, some of these things, I don't know if you can see them here on the, on the screen are examples, right? It's the cargo moving on ship. It's uh, intrusion detection systems, uh, barriers uh, uh, near and around things like nuclear power plants or motorcades in Washington, D.C. Uh, more simply, it's, your, it's everybody walking around with cell phones. It's sensors in the pavement detecting uh, pedestrians walking. 
smart parking systems, the vehicles themselves. Um, in addition, many other sort of environmental sensors, all are things that typically in the past have been sort of standalone or in their own network and do not share that information. Um, but it's relatively simple and it is not a technological leap to bring these systems together uh, and organize the data that they generate. Now, the issue is there's a lot of this data being generated. Not all of it is valuable. So here's another one of my favorite statistics. 35 zettabytes a year are going to come off all these things to what end? I don't know. Anybody know what a zettabyte is? It's 10 to the 21st so it's a really enormous amount of data. I, mean, I guess we do. There's somebody over there who knew what a zettabyte was, but I was too, too shy to point it out. You'll have a chance again. There'll be another big Greek uh, prefix that you can identify correctly. So, so one question I would say is, hooray, 35, uh, 35 zettabytes a year. Should we, should we grab all this data? What will we do with it? 35 zettabytes is a big, is a big, big number. Um, and I'll talk a minute. Some of the smaller numbers dwarf what we can currently um, what we can currently manage in our system. So, opportunity, absolutely. Risk, I think so. Something in the lines of not all of this is going to be valuable. We want to grab it for various reasons. So let's try and think of some uh, straightforward use cases and ways of of making sort of harmony out of this data generation rather than just having all the data spit out. Now, if I were an Internet of Things person, that would be heresy. They don't, they don't say stuff like that. They say, bring all the data. We'll figure it out. Just bring it all. My point as a guy who has to look at comm systems loading is that 35 zettabytes is too much. I, I don't want to look at 35 zettabytes of data. It's, it will break everything that I have to just put my arms around it. So I'm not an Internet of Things guy, although I think it's very interesting. So because my world is really focused on um, the surface transportation system. So one of the key things that I, I have worked on uh, for uh, in setting it up for the last uh, five to six years is, uh, and I've been working in, is the Connected Vehicle Research uh, Program uh, sponsored by the, my client, primary client, which is the Intelligent Transportation Systems Joint Program Office, which is an overarching uh, organization within the US DOT that looks at the combined system, not just highways alone, not maritime alone, uh, we are we do stay on the surface, so it doesn't include air at the moment. But transit systems, freight systems, rail, anything that goes across the surface uh, or runs underneath it, we we take a look at trying to organize and manage those systems. So we we feel like uh, in the past five or six years there's been enough research done and enough commercial products out there that we can start taking advantage of wirelessly connected vehicles, mobile devices, and smart infrastructure in some interesting ways that can improve mobility, safety, and the environment. Uh, and what I'll tell you is the interesting thing about it is that the technical stuff is not the hardest. And I think most people that <laughs> work in this space will agree. There are some technical issues that need to be resolved, but really some of this institutional and financial stuff is the, is the hardest part. And to go back to my theme from before, the institutional and financial components, the way the language we use around it has a lot of impact about whether or not these things are seen as positive technologies or negative technologies. And I don't think right now that we've done enough Thanks to the theme I'll come back to, to make sure that we talk about these technologies in ways that is both balanced and, and positive uh, to show that it does have some, some benefits. So in any case, I'm going to give you some examples of the kind of research that has been conducted over the last few years. It's just a snippet uh, of a couple of things that are absolutely positively doable. And uh, we, we've seen prototypes. Actually, this particular one ran in, uh, in, in Columbus at the Ohio State University, as well as in Orlando, Florida. Uh, so here's an example, relatively simple, of a person who's on a bus here who needs to make a connection to this bus here. I don't know if you guys are big bus riders here, but generally it's a, bit, it's a panic moment. If you see that your bus is about to leave, that means you've got 35 minutes or an hour or an hour and a half or eight hours to cool your heels right here or trying to find another way home if you miss that connection. In fact, mo many well, when you ask folks why they do or do not take transit, if they have to make a connection, they're something like five times less likely to use transit. So connection protection is something that airlines do, where they say, hey, you know, we got 18 people on this bus, and we've got two people on this bus, and even though it's scheduled to leave, why don't we wait and help let this connection be made? 
So again, technologically it's not that hard for someone to log that request here, uh, and then this is sort of a magical shard that goes back to the transit management center, and they hold the bus, and they can make the connection. So in addition, if we combine that with other technologies that allow us to say, hey, this bus is running behind schedule, let's time the lights so that these folks can make it uh, and make a connection. Again, these are all things that have been prototyped, uh, and we expect to see examples on the ground in operational systems uh, in the next two to three years. This isn't too much rocket science, I don't think, but uh, this particular thing uh, has the potential to really increase uh, ridership and allow more dynamic routing and uh, the changing of transit schedules and allows the transit delivery to be made in a way that appeals to riders, gives them more power, and also, uh, for example, increases ridership. Okay, that's just a, an example. Not, actually, I don't think that one's too wild. Definitely doable, it can be done. Here's one that's a little bit more, uh, possibly more uh, farther out there. Um, this is a, I, I did not draw these, uh, by the way, this is a, some, uh, an artist rendering of a big incident with hazmat. And what I like to start with is to say, I think only an artist would draw the guys in the, in the environmental suits standing in the hazardous spill. <laughs> so I, I, I do not condone this as a form of incident management. This is not my idea of connected incident management where the, <laughs> where the workers are making direct contact with the hazardous material. Uh, but in any case, you know, I, I think it's, uh, I like the artwork, so I'm happy to use it. Uh, but in any case, uh, so this is um, some stuff that was prototyped uh, in, outside of Maryland, uh, it, it, in, the, in the University of Maryland was part of it, uh, and in Prince George's County, which is a suburb of, uh, of Washington, D.C. So in this case, essentially what happens is that for a major incident, uh, there's a command vehicle that can get on scene and then make uh, communications, a lot of data flowing back and forth, it's not just like, you know, roger that, uh, about the nature of the scene, it can transmit data, video images, all sorts of other data, environmental sensors on the command vehicle, and then, and then, uh, that can be transformed into information to let people know what's happening and how long the delay is like, uh, likely to be, as well as stage the vehicles that arrive, the responding vehicles, allow them to be more effectively routed, and then what's interesting is that the placement of these vehicles at the site turns out to be a huge problem because, I don't know if you, well, hopefully you've never been to a major incident like this, but the, essentially what happens is a lot of people rush, a lot of emergency vehicles rush to the site and they park wherever they can find a spot. So a lot of times what happens is that the first responding people, first responding vehicles, drop their vehicles and then the hazmat cleanup vehicles can't get near the site. So the man, it's like a parking lot management with very tight space moving things around. So the, the command vehicle can actually generate a computerized staging plan that essentially is broadcast. They know all the vehicles are going to come, how they're going to respond, what equipment's going to be brought, and where they park. Again, very prosaic, but it turns out to be very important in clearing incidents much faster, like big ones like this. So again, this is, is, ha is happening now. Uh, it's, a, it's a prototype system uh, we expect to see. Uh, things like this in regular operation uh, in the next few years as part of a, a standard uh, deployment. So, so I think that's, that's great. Uh, and I, I think I could go on much longer with about 30 other slides. I won't do it. These are all examples of new technologies helping to solve problems that we understand pretty well, right? These problems have been around. We're using the new technology to solve that problem better faster, cheaper. Great. We should do it. But there are implications, I think, um, in going large scale in this realm. So before we all go out and buy this stuff and put it all in, so here's, here's some, another statistic for you. So right now the National Highway Transportation Safety Administration, which is a regulatory agency, is considering a rule that says all vehicles generated after a certain date, or built in the United States after a certain date, will generate every tenth of a second a certain message related to safety that will enable sort of crash avoidance, you don't crash into somebody near you. It's a short range message, relatively simple. It just sort of describes your position. So I think you can see through fog and all sorts of stuff. It's not a bad idea, but it's generated pretty rapidly, right? Because when you're about to crash into somebody, you're not going to say, well, you know, hi, I'm a, you know, I'm a Plymouth Voyager, 1988. <laughs> I 
know, going about 45 miles an hour, and you know, it, by the time the important information is transferred, the crash has occurred. So it's a very lean message that provides just the information you need to know about the trajectory of that vehicle so that applications on the other vehicle can avoid it. Now, so if this data were generated and all those cars, the total fleet, uh, American fleet were generated, the peak delivery of, uh, of, of data just from this safety message is 27 peta petabytes per second. All right, so do you know what a petabyte is? Uh, 10 to the 15th. Right on. So great. So we, 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 got a, we have a Greek scholar in the room. That's great. I always appreciate it when the classics people come to the technology discussions. Right on. That's a lot. 10 to the 15th is a lot of data, and it's every second being generated. So one of the things that people, that many folks say, especially on the, um, that, that I work with, is like, let's just collect that up. We bring that all together, see what we can do with it. Well, it's currently roughly the same order or magnitude of all current internet data volume. So we need to build another internet just to pull those data in. That's, that, that could be an expensive thing. Or we build or we expand the capacity of the internet to, to generate. But it's not clear that any of this will help manage the system. Those two examples I just showed you would not benefit from this particular message. It would benefit marginally, but it wouldn't actually enable all those applications that you just saw to happen. It would just mostly be background noise uh, doing the safety stuff, yes, but it wouldn't enable all the application I just showed you. So some of the research that, that we do, and I won't get into the, 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 the technical details, is really trying to figure out, all right, what are the data that are really required to make these interesting applications happen? Uh, and how much of it is needed? And how should it be sent? And what of it is urgent? And what parts are not so urgent? Uh, so we can manage the data flow intelligently. And so there, there are, I mean, if, if if you want me to come back and show you all my briefing decks with equations, I'll be happy to do that to show you how we can try and figure out the load in the system and manage so that the data that flows out of the system has value, and we bring the data out of the system with the most value, with, but leave the redundant data ungenerated, untransmitted, and unpaid for. Okay, so that's broadly the, the challenges. So now I'm gonna actually shift gears a little bit about the connected vehicles and the connected everything component and talk about some of the things that aren't just making the stuff we do now better, but making, uh, enabling us to do stuff that we haven't been able to do before. So now I'm gonna come back a little bit at the language of how we talk about why we have a surface transportation system. So as I pointed out in my one talk, my talk in one slide thing, we do not have a surface transportation system to kill people, to destroy vehicles, to destroy the environment, or to make everybody mad, right? That, that's not why we have it. It's not like a, a disabusement park or a, <laughs> it's not like go out there, somebody's gonna get killed, everybody's gonna be mad, and the environment's gonna go to pot, right? So that, that is not why we have a system. But I'll come back to it later. The language that we use to talk about the transportation system focuses on this byproduct stuff. We have the systems to do good stuff, which is to move people and goods reliably across the system. And it's relatively obvious, right? So it, it's not that much of a shock to find out that we have a system, a transportation system, to move people and stuff around. But the problem is that a lot of times we don't talk about it and we haven't had the tools previously to give it the preeminence and the quantitative rigor that the byproducts have. So, why do we get ourselves in this hole? Because we can measure, we can quantify, we can point to, we can gasp at the bad stuff. They're easier to observe, they're out there, they're countable in ways uh, because they are snapshots in time, you can reveal a lot about the bad stuff that happens. You can count the crashes, you can count the fatalities. In this particular, uh, particular example of our incident, you can measure how long the queue goes back and how much delay this person might have experienced and then how much of this stuff ended up in the drinking water, right? So that turns out to be what we have traditionally focused on measuring because it's easier to measure. And unfortunately, because it's easier to measure, it shows up a lot on our performance measurement dashboards for these kinds of systems. Our, not everybody does it this way, but in many cases, 
the dashboard themselves, the language that is used to talk about why we're doing a great job with our systems focuses on these byproducts. And it has a weird counter effect, uh, counterintuitive and counterproductive effect. Number one is, if nobody uses the system, no bad stuff can happen, right? So if everyone stays in their houses and slowly starves to death, those deaths and those delay and that unhappiness will not be associated with the transportation system. Hey, thumbs up. That's our goal. But that, is, that is not our goal. That is not our goal, right? But that has a weird, this, that sort of underlying sort of reality has weird impacts that are more nuanced down the, down the pipe. So the first thing is that whenever we look at trying to improve a system, anything that incentivizes underutilization looks better by definition. Fewer users, on average, fewer deaths, fewer stuff in the environment, fewer delays, right? So anything that restrains utilization is a good, has a good impact, no matter what it does, right? So if we had two different technologies, we're thinking about deploying, and one had a 13% reduction in fatalities, and one had a 12% reduction in fatalities, which one would we choose? The one that gave us 13%, but maybe it doesn't allow anybody to get anywhere or reduces mobility in a way that is unpleasant. Well, if we're not measuring, monetizing, and bringing that quantification into our analysis, then we'll never have that balanced effect. We'll always choose the thing, the thing, that promotes underutilization. So it makes any improvement hard to justify. I kind of explained it there. I mean, you have to look at both sides. If you only look at the byproducts, you're not really seeing the full picture. And the other weird thing that happens is that I, and I'm being a little bit mean here, so there's this lip service management culture. The folks that manage these systems talk about the systems. Uh, my clients that talk about the value of our system, um, they'll say things like, safety is our number one objective, which is great, sounds good. But if it was, we would just tell everybody to stay home, right? Don't use the system. It's taken to an extreme. But unfortunately, that, that sort of statement, which makes everybody sort of feel good, like, yeah, but we, people should be safe. That should be an objective. I'm not saying it's not. But unfortunately, at this, but they say that and then out of the side of the mouth say, well, but we still need to use it. Yeah, so we're, 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 we're interested in the safety, but you know, but people still need to use the system. So it's kind of almost a dishonest kind of statement. So that's why I don't like, like these, these definitive statements about the use of the transportation system and the management focus for transportation system and the studies of transportation systems being too heavily focused on the byproducts. And there are lots of people who do uh, just this. And it also, unfortunately, leads to irrational investment. Because if you're not doing a balanced assessment of the byproducts and the products, then you can make weird, bad decisions for investments that don't really improve the system, but just somehow have the effect of restraining access to the system uh, and causing it the, the byproducts to go down. So, so why do we get ourselves in this box? Why, why have we talked about it this way? traditionally for so many years, because we can't really do a good job of measuring the product. We can't really, and traditionally, without things being connected, so I'll come back to the first part of my talk, without knowing something about the, the, the movement of people and vehicles across the system and goods, we can't really talk about what trips were delivered, how much mobility was generated in the system. So, so I'm, I, you know, as Nagi said, we've known each other for almost two decades now. I'm not a young person. When I started <laughs> in, in this field, uh, the thing I thought was interesting about it, because I came from manufacturing, was that it seemed to me like everybody was getting PhDs in water buffalo behavior. Now, why do I say that? If you're a zoologist, you go into the field, what you do is you, you go to one location. You say, okay, you count the water buffaloes. Okay, there's 18, 19, 30 water buffaloes here in the various sizes. And then you go back to your camp and you go to some other spot the next day. And then you count water buffaloes over there. And you don't know whether any of the water buffaloes you saw the day before are the same water buffaloes you see the day over here. Now you count, oh, there are, there are 26. So did four of them get eaten by crocodiles? We don't know. We don't know what happened in between. We don't even know if they're the same one. So we can only describe the state, the well-being of the water buffalo herd in terms of their number in snapshots in time, right? So again, if, they, if these water buffaloes got attacked by a, a crocodile right there, we say, oh, well, there's a fatality. But we, we, we don't, <laughs> but, we, but we're unlikely to see the experience of the water buffaloes over time. 
the water bubbles are trying to go someplace and exist, right? That they're, they're actually moving around. So it's not quite as terrible as an analogy as I, as I may make it sound here. But the point is that everything is indistinct. We can't tell them apart. We can only say, count them and size them and categorize them where we find them. But we don't have to treat people, vehicles, goods, like the water buffalo anymore. We can say, all right, let's, let's talk about a new way of measuring what happens in the system. Because if many things are connected or a few things are connected, one of the nice things that we can do is take a look at trips. That is a revealed, observed component of the system now. And I have one right here in my pocket. And chances are you do too. This is the thing that would allow us to track trips or understand trip delivery in the system because these devices check in with the cell tower and other things and we can, we can use them in the way that people interact with, the, with these phones to make these assumptions. In fact, there's been uh, two very interesting pieces of research at MIT and the University of Minnesota that the USDOT has, uh, has taken a look over the last two years. So the smartphone uh, with the correct kind of application running underneath it sort of can inventory over time something like a trip diary, if you guys have done trip diary work before, by inferring what you're doing at any time. And then once in a while sort of check in or to validate to make sure its guesses are correct. So you don't have to do anything. Uh, and if you're part of a system where you want to say, hey, this is, I'm making, uh, I'm making a trip for this reason, um, or I'm arriving on time, or I'm not arriving on time, these devices are very powerful in terms of revealing an observed trip making a person or goods in the system. On the, on the good side, it's these smart tags, same kind of stuff. The tag says, oh, well, this is what's in the container. It needs to be at the port at such and such time. All that stuff is there. So essentially, these two kinds of things allow us to see the, our, our water buffalo again in both locations and make the combination. Like, aha, the water buffalo that was there yesterday is now over here. So I guess that's a good thing for the water buffalo. They made it through the night. How many made it through the night? Well, OK. Four of them got eaten by crocodiles. So now we can talk something about the experience, the experience of the travel of the goods in the system, which is good. So that reveals the product. So the other interesting thing is that in reality, not every trip is really, 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 really as important as every other trip. So you know, there's a great deal of sort of egalitarian saluting of the flag. What I'm going to tell you is that sometimes there's a trip that is more urgent than another. So this person here says, hooray, I'm a home on time. That's a, that's a great thing. So this is the happy, connected city afterwards. We get all the stuff together. Like, oh, I, I made a trip. I'm home on time. Hooray, I get, to, I get to see the beginning of Batman like I wanted to. All right, you know, good. That's great. That's a, that's a good thing, right? There's nothing wrong. Batman's great if you wanted to see it. So there you go. Over here on the, on the roadway, here's a truck that says, OK, I'll make it to the port in my time window. Now, that may have real commercial implications for the, both the shipper and for the uh, for the manufacturing facility that's waiting for that shipment. So I don't know that it's necessarily more valuable than this guy being able to watch Batman, but at least we know the difference because these trips are not the same. And this trip here, you know, well, if there's enough information, we can say, hey, you're going to make it to the hospital before the baby's born. Um, you know, I guess there are other factors in there just besides congestion or something. But in any case, the point is, I might argue, I might argue, that this trip is more urgent than this trip. Okay, but it depends on the, on the viewpoint. Anyway, so if we understand not only trips as an entity, water buffalo here, water buffalo there, but the no, what that trip purpose is, its urgency, something about what is happening, then we can make smarter decisions about how we manage the system so that the highest value trips are served. Now, of course, we gotta do all that. Well, somebody will put their hand up and go, well, I'm going to get a transponder that says I'm having a baby every day. I'll never be late for work, right? So, okay. So we have to sort of figure out how to make the system sort of spoof-proof, develop this community so that uh, that if we can uh, if we can differentiate high and lower value trips, and we can serve and accommodate them, we can really raise the value of the product that we generate in the system, measure it, and differentiate it. Okay. So managing a system to maximize products while minimizing byproducts is better for everybody. So I'm not saying maximize product and ignore the other stuff. No. You've got to look at both. And, but the good news is if you do this, 
no users, no product. So the, our mental thought process of, uh, of chaining everyone up in their houses and have them slowly starve turns out not to be a good thing after all, uh, given this sort of, because uh, we, we don't get any product, no one uses the system. And it incentivizes efficient utilization. We don't want as many people to use the system because at some point, delay in the byproducts will build up and swamp the value of the product. In fact, we might declare that trips that don't make it to the hospital on time, the baby's born into the car to be an unsuccessful trip, right? Or the delivery to the port not making it on time to be unsuccessful. That's not product. That's quality control. We throw that out uh, in manufacturing. We'd say that was not successful. That We have to take one back and rework it. So improvements, when you do this way, can, much, can be much better and more fairly compared against each other. So that 13%, 12% stuff, we've got the other side of it. What is the mobility impact? How much product is, is, is impacted in the system from the 13% improvement from safety or the 12% improvement from safety? So now, <laughs> the other implication is that we can stop being kind of weaselly about why we have the system and what our culture is. We have a system that we, we manage we maximize the product, we minimize the product. We want to get the most people through the system, the highest value every day, with the fewest fatalities, fewest crashes, smallest amount of delay, least amount of environmental impact. We have a bottom line that includes both those things. I, that's a legitimate way to talk about the system. But we start with the product. We don't say, yeah, oh, we hope we don't kill as many people this year. Okay, we're talking about we're going to count what we move, we're going to move the good stuff, we're going to bring value to the system, and we're going to make sure that these other bad things are minimized as much as possible. And I think that's like an honest way of talking about it and a real realistic way. And we can back it up now with a quantification and a measurement of the value delivered by the system. Oops, wrong way. Which leads to effective investment. So I'm just going to say, hooray, now we can really spend money on stuff that does good stuff and not just avoid bad stuff. Right, okay. So now, breathe in, breathe out, new topic. So why should we care about how we talk about the system? And who really cares about the transportation system and how we talk about it? How, why would we want to control the language and make sure that we're talking about it in ways that is balanced, effective, and positive? Because this connected everything includes the connected people that use the system. And right now, I'm telling you, it is happening. The connected consumer is already here, right? The connected consumer is already here and powerful. So anybody in the room use TripAdvisor? Yeah, okay. A lot of people use TripAdvisor, right? So it's only been around for 14 years. So that's not a big surprise. But it now has 60 million <laughs> members and 170 million reviews worldwide. So I can tell you that I am old enough to live in a world before TripAdvisor, right? And I used to go travel in those days. And you had like guidebooks and everything else. And you know, it was a different kind of world. Uh, and the hotels, and especially when you go on like, uh, like trips to Europe or something like that, they weren't that concerned about making you happy, I'll have to say. I mean, some were because they were nice or whatever else. But it really wasn't a bottom line issue. They were nice to you because they were nice. That was sort of the, the but now you cannot get away with that. If you have a bed and breakfast someplace, and you're serving up greasy eggs, and you're smoking in front of the people, <laughs> and you're, you're making them feel uncomfortable, you are not going to be in business very long. Because people are going to go to TripAdvisor and say, you know, Carl Blue smoke in my face, and his eggs are terrible, and the bed is lumpy. My business is dead. I'm dead. That business, I'm out of business. So, and in fact, plenty of people study this effect. I mean, this is a big deal. TripAdvisor is in the S&P 500. It's a one and a half billion dollar company, right? And it start, actually started, I don't have time, sorry. It started, I'm fascinated by this effect. Started in 2000 not to do the business model at all. This was not their business model. All they wanted to do is say, look, we can bring together all the guidebook material, you know, the Rick Steves and the whatever else, and we'll put them all together in the newspaper clippings, put them in one spot, People will come and they'll pay so they can see all the reviews at once and we'll put the reviews together. And oh, maybe we'll put a little comment box at the bottom. And it will turn out that nobody cared about the professional content. They cared about, Carl blew smoke in my face and this bed is terrible, I'm never going back. And that, that's what people wanted to see. They didn't really care about the professional reviews and that's when this thing sort of blew up. So they were, they were smart business people 
by saying, look, turns out people just want to hear about their experiences from other people. They're not so interested in the reviews from the New York Times or Rick Steves. Although those two places are doing just fine. Thank you very much. But it is a bottom line issue. Not just like, you know, Carl's Bed and Breakfast is out of business, you know, boo-hoo. But there's very interesting sort of uh, academic research in this area about what it means to have your business, your bed and breakfast or anything else, slide up or down one star on the TripAdvisor thing. And so what they found, most recent stuff, is that one star improvement, you can charge 11% more for the exact same thing if it, it, it delivered in the service. So if you can get that star, it's 11% profit, essentially, if you realize it, right? That, that's what's really, so it is a bottom line issue for anybody providing these services. Now, I'm bringing up another real quick topic here. So the mass influencer. I happen to live with one. Um, so a mass influencer is somebody who goes into TripAdvisor or any of these sites and becomes so ingrained in the, like stays on the thread, watches it, it keeps track of what's happening at the various restaurants or resorts or whatever is being followed, and they sort of answer questions. People say, well, how, how greasy were Carl's eggs? Well, you know, and they, they, they can put in information. Everybody can at least you walk to the park. Yeah, it's easy to walk to the park. But you got to watch out, you know, there's a dog that might bite you on the way. So anyway, so you, you becomes essentially a, a third-party reviewer of the facility itself or whatever is being talked about. And these mass influencers ha are huge. And in fact, the, the hotel industry and the restaurant industry spends an enormous amount of time figuring out how they can cultivate the mass influencer. Uh, and I'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute. Okay, so why am I telling you about TripAdvisor? Why, would that, why is that even a surface transportation issue? Because they're coming. What I'm calling the mobility consumer is coming. But unfortunately, because I don't think in some cases we've done a good job of controlling the language around the delivery of the service, we are generating essentially estranged mobility consumers. Okay, you know I live in Washington, D.C. I take the metro to work. I, I work downtown. My office is downtown just behind the Air and Space Museum, which is great, which is great. Uh, but it's $25, $27 a day to park. So I'm not driving. And if I did, it's like an hour and 35 minutes. I take metro. I'm a transit guy. I, I take metro to work. And um, I don't know if, you, if it makes news down here, but the metro system has been having some troubles lately. They're running out of money. They had a fire that produced some smoke and it killed the, the, one of the people on the train not too long ago. Uh, they had a crash on the red line uh, a couple years ago where the automatic control system failed and it killed six people. Um, okay, so now I'm, I'm, but anyway, so I'm talking about Metro as a rider, but what am I talking about? I'm talking about all the bad stuff that happens in Metro, right? Because that's, that's the way people talk about Metro because that is the language used around Metro. And so anybody, we could all get together and complain about Metro or something, right? But the point is that now you can go to a website called Fix Metro and you can tweet or Instagram your unpleasant experience on Metro. And we'll add it here. There is a place that you can go. You can say, oh, Metro, I hate Metro, right? And you can get on your Twitter feed and you can follow at unsuck DC Metro, right? But this is not, this is not positive. This is, this is a whole community built around the bad stuff that happens when you ride Metro, not the good stuff. There's nothing about this site that is about the good stuff that Metro does. Metro doesn't kill people every day, just sometimes. But that service isn't so good. But generally, I'll tell you, even though it's an older system, I can get from where I I have not been killed on it yet. I have not been, uh, you know, I, so the point is I use it. I pay for it. I, it gets me to work, you know, all the time, sometimes a little late. But better than, the, than checking my car, I still choose to take Metro because it's better than driving and cheaper, right? So Metro's not there to kill people. But you wouldn't know it from this website because they don't take pleasant experiences here. And it, it, the organization name is not We Love Metro. It's Fix Metro, right? That's, that's the tone of this interaction. That is a language around the provision of this transportation service. And anytime there's any problem with Metro, the reporters do the obvious thing. They say, oh, let's just go to Fix Metro and see what, you know, let's see what happened today. Oh, something terrible, right? And you can find something else. I just went there. You can find almost something every day, something wrong with Metro that they post. Here's, 
here's the, I take these trains, the red line trains, so here's some snarky person, that, you know, they took a picture of a train that's marked as going to Glenmont. This train's not going to Glenmont. It, it, it wasn't, you know, it's, mis, it's mislabeled, <laughs> it's not going to Glenmont. Or like, or, and here's some very adversarial language. Station manager at Silver Spring shut the elevator door when I started filming this, right? Okay, so, so here's an entire community of your system users that are essentially adversaries. They're estranged from the system. They see themselves as the, as the people who are being somehow harmed every day by Metro. <laughs> and this is the venue. There's no, Metro does some good stuff. Website, that doesn't happen. There, the, this language never appears. And so the focus is always on whatever Metro's doing that is wrong. Okay. Now I'm going to come back to uh, the, the TripAdvisor example. So here's an example of a provider. This is a uh, couple. Does anybody go to Jamaica? Very nice set of resorts there called Couples. We've been there a couple times. Uh, it's a lovely place to go. Now, I'm not going to try and tell you that trips to Jamaica and riding the metro are less similar. They're not. But there are good and bad experiences on going on vacation, especially in a foreign country, right? And people will get a little nervous. I mean, Jamaica has, does have some social issues there. It is not uh, like going to Florida. It's a little bit different. Be very safe. We've had many trips there. It's super awesome. We're going again in November. So uh, this particular uh, resort chain called Couples, um, they have done a lot of work to make sure that their social media sites are up to date, that they have, are cultivating their consumers, especially the mass influencers. I mean, lots of resorts are doing this. These guys, I think, do it particularly well. So. They reach out to frequent posters and return guests. They care, carefully monitor anything reports in, in, in TripAdvisor. They set up their own site uh, for people to ask questions, um, and folks get in there and answer those questions. A lot of times, the resort themselves do not have to answer the question. In fact, they, they prefer not to, because they wait for the other people who are mass influencers who've gone to the resort a couple times. And some people have gone there like 25 times. So somebody says, you know, which room should I get? Close to the beach or should I be farther away? Uh, how much noise is going to come from the, like the disco building in the middle of the night? And so what will happen is that somebody will jump on there immediately and say, oh, if, you're gonna, if you don't like to stay, if you like noise, if you don't like noise at night, stay in these bungalows over here. They're much quieter, okay? The resort doesn't do any of that. It's done by the mass influencers, right? And they've cultivated this group. And actually what's funny is that people that come to the site trust the mass influencers more than they trust the resort, because they figure the resort will only tell, it's quiet everywhere, right? Oh, it's every room is terrific, right? You know, it's not true. But the mass influencers have this, um, not all news is positive, but they're trusted in a way that the provider can't be, right? So it's okay, so they've, but they've cultivated them, and they, and they don't, it's not like a bribery system, like, oh, here's a couple hundred bucks, put something nice in there. None of that, I mean, for these guys, none of that happens. But they do communicate with the mass influencers. They, they share with them the good stuff and the bad stuff that's going on, so they're more informed. And the relationship all the way around, from the resort to the mass influencers to the people who are coming on that are maybe prospective users of the service of this particular uh, resort, I think everybody benefits because it's a, the language is both positive and negative, and the relationships are built on trust, but not adversarial. Okay, so how do we thrive in a connected uh, everything world? So this is um, just sort of some takeaways um, from, from the talk. Essentially, I, I told you everything. I told you everything I was going to say now uh, twice. <laughs> this is just sort of the wrap up. So how, how do we how do we really put some of this together into in a way that, that can help us to thrive uh, as transportation service transportation people? Whether you manage a system, whether you work for a state DOT, whether you're a consultant, whether you're a federal employee, whether you're a system user, everybody's got in and intersects with the transportation system at some point. So as leaders in talking about transportation, I guess my point is the connected everything world has, I think, an important opportunity for us. Number one, to do all the stuff we have been doing better, faster, cheaper, full stop. That's great. We should do it. Clear the instance faster, retime the lights, get people connected with the, um, uh, make their transit connections. That stuff we can do. We can absolutely do. And it doesn't really take 
it just takes work, right? And it's the stuff we know how to do. It's like going down the same path or hiking the same trail you've hiked before. You just climb that mountain one more time, now you can do it faster and better. But I think we have an opportunity to do something, I think, that is important, but not something we, we think about or normally do when we talk about transportation systems. That is, we can say, all right, these data that we have allow us to talk about the system in terms with new language about the product and the value of the system that is, that is as equal and as quantitative and as rigorous as the bad stuff that happens in the system. So we should get our brains set up to do it. If we're going to talk, if we're going to be transportation leaders, we need to be, be careful the way we talk about it. We can't just use the throwaway phrases that say, oh, you know, safety is our number one priority. Again, I don't want to harp on that one too much, but just be careful about the things you say, the sound bites that you produce, uh, and the way that you rigorously talk about making investments in the system. Because if you go on the slippery slope of just sticking with the, the byproduct management, a lot of this connected vehicle stuff, you know, it'll be better, a little better, absolutely. But I don't think that it'll really change essentially the relationship between the users and the managers, the perception of the transportation system as sort of an unpleasant utility you know, inefficient, unpleasant utility versus what I think it is, which I think is a, is a dynamically changing, uh, I mean, the amount of throughput that we can put through now, so much higher than it used to be. Uh, part, I mean, it, it is sort of amazing some of the statistics, if you do look at sort of some of these positives, the amount of trips that the, our systems in urban areas, even the ones that get the worst blame, can deliver is tremendous, is tremendous, but we've never, it's, it's only the conversation among the most pointy-headed econometric people, never really the conversation with the media, the system users, uh, and with the people that fund, <laughs> that fund the transportation system. We, we don't talk about it. It's, too, it's too, considered too weird, but I think we can use these data to talk about it. And another important thing is that while we're learning, I think, to talk about the system more effectively, we need to try out talking to our users in, in, in that way and to bring them in so that it's not like, you know, unsuck the DOT, right? That, 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 shouldn't be the, that shouldn't be the goal of the interaction with your users. You should say, look, you're part of the system too, right? You, when, when we build an honest relationship together where we share the bad news and the good news with you and you share with us information about your trip purpose, we may be able to do something about managing the system in a more intelligent way. And of course, there are gonna be mass influencers uh, in this system, so we need to identify them, cultivate them. It's a bottom line issue. It should be as much a bottom line issue for transportation systems as it is for resorts and restaurants. Uh, and don't be afraid to share that bottom line with your users. If you're doing something better, you should be able to show it in a way that, is, uh, it, that shows both sides of, of the equation. And so I, I think that's the, I mean, if I, if I leave you with anything, it's, it's, if, you're, if you're called to sort of testify <laughs> at any point, and we all do, I use that term broadly, about the, about the system, or if you hear somebody testifying in Congress or appearing before a state DOT board or at a public meeting talking about the system, listen to the language that they use. I will bet, because there's only a very, a very few handful of people that do this well, that they will give lip service to the product and they'll focus on the, on the fatalities, crashes, and environmental stuff. That the conversation will slide almost immediately to that. And then it's hard to get excited about funding a system that only does bad stuff, right? Or at least that's all you hear about. Um, and so I think, I think the data that comes from this kind of activity, the, the data that connected everything, and I use the people as one of the key things that connect here, allows us to use our language to, I think, pull ourselves out of a hole we've been in. Uh, for, I don't know, 25, 30 years in my case, um, and, and talk about it and, and sort of change the relationship uh, between the transportation system, the users, and the people who fund it. And with that, I'll just stop. Don't be bashful. George. George. So you bring to mind the contrast between funding health care and funding transportation. So 
because even though the healthcare system makes mistakes and people don't necessarily survive, what we think about is lives saved, and we think about all the good things that come from that. So, is there an ability to do any sort of technology transfer or insight transfer of those kinds of things? Yeah. So, it, with uh, at Noblis, I think we we have a pretty large group that supports. Um, uh, CMS, which is the Centers for Medicaid and Medicare Services. And so, I, George, you're exactly right in terms of the broad healthcare system. I, I, I think our healthcare system has a generally good reputation, except for boy, it's expensive, right? But people live longer and all that kind of stuff. So the, the metrics of of lives saved is very powerful in that case because it's it's a positive, right? So the although people do die in hospitals, they don't die of because of hospitals generally. They, they die because something happened to them first and they went in there. Um, so I, I do think the, the the I think your healthcare analogy is a good one, uh, and trying to because I think they do do a better job of talking about the products because the products are positive, right? And, and it's easy to sort of put in the front. What I will say is that the that the Medicare and Medicaid folks are like are, are unfortunately seen it as like the payment, like that's the focus for Medicare and Medicaid almost always in the in the conversation that I encounter are. Our clients in that space and the folks like me, the consultants that support them, I think they, they, on that particular realm, fall into the same thing like Medicare, Medicaid is expensive. That's the first thing. And the payment is, is, is irrational. It's riddled with fraud. <laughs> and th th that's the conversation around uh, the, center, oh, the Center for Medicaid and Medicaid provision. They, they almost, almost always deal with the negative uh, attributes. So I think that it's a good example. I hadn't thought about it to sort of turn the, the language around for that too. Because in the end, you know, Medicare Medicaid is, does provide a service. Yeah. You know, it, but, it, but the hospitals and stuff get the, get the benefit. <laughs> and then, then the, the, the payment provider, even though they're paying, you think that like, hey, hooray, they're paying. It would be a good, but it, it, they almost always get cast in a negative light. And I think government programs in general have that problem where uh, you know, given the, the state of w the way that Americans think about the government, I mean, I think generally they do okay, but they don't really like Congress. You know, they, the, it's very low. And, and in general, the government is seen more of a, as a risk now, I think, than a, than a provider of services. And so I, I think across our client base, I think we are looking for opportunities to say, hey, it's not all negative stuff. What are, what are the positive components? I, I was just thinking the healthcare. I think analogies is good as well, though, because we don't we don't go to the hospital like we go to the theater, right? I mean, it's positive, but we all hope we have health and don't have to go. And in some ways, a transport a trip is the same thing. I mean, if we could snap our fingers and everything we wanted to do was across the street, right. that'd be great. Sure. I mean, the trip is you know, except for the few people that own you know maybe a Aston Martin or something. I mean, very few of us do a trip <coughs> for pleasure. It's That's for, right. It's for something else, so. right? And, and there's value. Obviously, we, we wouldn't do it if there if there wasn't value. And so the you know the econometricians and you know if we, if we have any in the room, they can jump up and, and agree or disagree. But I think they're the only ones that have the conversation. It's just not part of the general vernacular about the system. Um, it's only a vernacular about that. Yeah, we should be able to do that. Like it's almost like an entitlement. And this other stuff kind of comes behind it. But you know, it's it, it's if you look at the sort of mobility capability, you know the how mobile we can be right now, where we can access sort of globally, it's at an all-time high, and it's really gone up, even from when I was a kid in the 70s, right? So where you can get in an hour and a half is much better now than it used to be. Now, an hour and a half during rush hour or peak period, because it's much longer than an hour in DC, may not be as good, but it's overall accessibility. I mean, our transportation system globally, just on the surface side, is so much more efficient than it, than it was in the 70s. But nobody, you won't hear that conversation. You only hear the conversation, bridges are crumbling, it's underfunded, it's unsafe, people are getting killed, environmental impacts. That's the first nine, nine things. And then maybe at the 10th, they say, yeah, and, and by the way, I can, you know, I drove down here from, I drove from Gaithersburg to, to, uh, to Raleigh in four hours and 16 minutes. Uh, that's pretty, without getting a ticket. <laughs> I mean, that's, that's pretty good, you know. I, I don't. I don't know that you certainly couldn't have done it in 1950. Absolutely couldn't have done it in 1950. You might have been able to do it in 1970, but I doubt it. I doubt it. Uh, I think so. So there's there are these elements of of accessibility, performance, throughput that unfortunately don't they don't make it to the conversation, and they're not they're not like part of the 
they're not really part of the grown-up conversation about transportation systems, which I think is crazy. It's like what the it's it's the it's the niche nerd conversation about it, and not the general conversation about it. <laughs> this question of privacy has been around ever since people have been or agencies have been collecting data about people in the connected world you're describing. It assumes different dimensions. Could you share with us your thoughts? About yeah, right on. So that's so a great great question. So I actually. Um, very much on purpose, didn't mention privacy in this because, again, I'm sure seeing what the language stuff was. So, again, I was focusing on the positive stuff first. Right, okay, so spoofing, cybersecurity, and privacy. Absolutely three killer issues, right? They're the three new fatalities in environmental and that, that can kill off the, the connected vehicle world, the connected. And so, so, absolutely, I think there are good ways of, of helping to manage privacy. I do not think in many cases that the government solution is the best solution to fix privacy. So, for example, um, one of the things that people do not seem to have a lot of trouble with is sharing their destinations with Google, right? Or any information service provider. So, I used it today. Not all of them take it down here. So, so why did I do that? Would I have done that with Google and not with the government? Right? Whatever, right? So, so the, the notion is that um, people, so, so, so in order to get as much as we can that's positive out of the system and protect <coughs> privacy, I think we need to look at where people feel comfortable about sharing information and, and not swim against the current, not have some dictate that says connected everything means, you know, I need to know where you are all the time. Like my dad would find my iPhone, right? So, so I think there are ways, one way is to, is to use a trusted third party that sits in between, that you trust, or I trust, or we figure, oh, what's Google going to do with that? Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, we're not going to worry about it, right? So they can clean it and sell it in aggregate form. Now some people are concerned about what Google's going to do with it. Okay, well then they don't have to participate. For the most part in this system, for many, many of the applications, we don't need everybody. We need some, and the sample size vary based on the thing you're trying to measure, but even trips. You know, a good 5% sample can tell us a lot about the performance of the system. So anyway, so, there's, so that's number one, is that we can use the mechanisms that already exist that people trust to get the benefit without necessarily calling into question the privacy of who, owns, who holds the data. That's one. The second is that the messages that are regulatory, like the safety message, have sort of privacy constraints built into them. They are sort of very generic messages and they do not persist. So that whole uh, 27 petabytes per second message, one of the problems with it is that it has no persistent ID of any type. So it's a lot of like the water buffaloes bellowing at various spots, but the cacophony doesn't mean anything in the end, right? So that inherently governmental message, which is for primarily for short range safety, is private Based on the you know based on the way it's designed, but it's not good for some of these other things. So different kinds of messages, maybe using these third parties. So so those things which are regulatory and government, we need to spend the time to make sure that the privacy is protected. I absolutely believe that because it's like another negative byproduct. If we don't manage it, it's going to overwhelm us, and the conversation will all be about that. So regulatory messages, we need to manage privacy. But besides that, and throwing up our hands, we need to look at the mechanisms where we can achieve our goals with things that there are natural trust relationships generated already. And in the end, I guess in a perfect world, you know, now I'm going to sing a little kumbaya for everybody, if we're all in this community of <coughs> users about the transportation system and a trust relationship has been built between all of us, then maybe we wouldn't have the trouble of sharing that information because we trusted what it would be used for. But that trust has to be earned, has to be cultivated. And I don't think there's very, there's very little energy in that space right now uh, because, again, it's, it's adversarial, it's a standaway uh, relationship between the users of the system and those that study, manage, and operate the system. Other questions? Just one real quick. Um, just a curiosity question about those in, in I'm, I'm from the city of Greensboro, and I represent a, a city of 280,000 people, all different socioeconomic spectrums. And really the question about uh, with those people in my community that couldn't afford technology to be able to take advantage of the system, um, what are some options there? How do you see that sort of coming online in the future where uh, a 
as these systems are deployed, the folks without the resources to upfit cars or even have cell phones. That's right. Right. So, so part of it is understanding sort of what, what's happening in the system. So even if there are users which are, are not sort of connected in this way, wirelessly connected, right? But they still want to access, let's just say, transit services. Okay. So if over time we're looking at, and there's some sample of folks who are connected, then we can use those patterns to derive a, a management structure which is more effective. So for example, one of the things I didn't show here is one of the one of the connected uh, vehicle <coughs> concepts is uh, sort of a, a getting rid of all fixed transit operations and moving only to essentially like a mobility as a service or an Uber type of service uh, where rather than pay for bus drivers or anything else, you get so sort of this door-to-door -door service or it's, it's a managed mobility service. And it makes most sense for dispersed, relatively uh, broadly dispersed. It's a, it's a rural application for the most part. So just as an example, I think in that case, there needs to be some way to initiate a request for service, but that could be done cell phone, or not cell phone, just like with a landline phone or whatever technology is available. So there has to be some mechanism to connect. But if there's a sample of people in the system and the vehicles themselves, and you're measuring and looking at the delivery of trips rather than just like, oh, what's ridership look like generally, then I think you can try to extract more value out of it, and you can provide more mobility to, the, to those users without necessarily, I mean, without intruding privacy, without them requiring them to buy a $500 cell phone or anything like that. So I think those are, that's just one example. But you can also take a look at some of like a, the pedestrian technology. Some is more, has more sort of a passive. You have smart pavement type things. So I think in general, the problem with transit service right, is that once a transit service is generated and a, and a fixed service is provided, it's almost impossible to get rid of it. It's like a governmental agency in Washington. Once it exists, it is almost impossible to remove because there is, you know, some a few people that really depend on that thing. There may be a small group, and you're putting this expensive big bus go up and down. But if you, as soon as you talk, you go to a meeting and say, "Well, I'm going to take bus 27 out," then you got you get a room full of people complaining that, "Yeah, you know, bus 27 can't take a road bus," so they can never get rid of it. So, <laughs> in a from a service perspective, where you're providing mobility as a service in a different way. Uh, then you can make those changes on the fly. I mean, you're not committing bus 20 to bus 27. You're saying, look, what I'm committing to is the provision of getting you from where you are to, to, to your job on time, whatever else. That's, that's our trusted relationship. Now, I may, you know, some days I may show up with a big bus. Some days I may show up with a, just a small car. Some days I may pay for you to take an Uber car or something because things are just crazy. But in general, we've got that, we're all in it together to, to make mobility work. Uh, and in some cases, it's been shown that that can be actually much cheaper than the fixed transit solution. But it depends. It depends on understanding the demand. If you don't understand the demand, if you don't understand your users, you can't make an informed leap into that space. So, we're, so at some point, you've got to collect the data. Uh, and, it, and it's easier when more people are connected, absolutely. But you don't need to have everybody connected. Joe. Sure. So one of the things I find interesting about uh, your remarks is that, you know, in traditional travel studies, you're pushing the discussion of the travel from the home end. You ask people, you know, in a travel diary format, starting with the householder as a person dwelling in a unit. And what's interesting about this to me is that in a study that's almost never done and very expensive and incredibly hard to conduct is an establishment survey where you try to focus on what people are doing at the destination end of the trip. And it seems to me that that's an extension of what you're talking about here where sooner or later we'll be able to actually mash up enough of this information to understand what people do when they get where they're going. That's right instead of, you know, the household end. So the destination might not really be the destination of choice. The destination registered may be the destination that is most convenient or, or had you know, what it was restricted to. And that there is another sort of chain of activity afterwards. So again, it's it's good. It's good to put together trips. It's better to put together trips that have some sort of meaning behind it. The more context that we have, the better we can serve. Right? And that, and that's the thing. So 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 I can't agree with you more, but the question is Again, 
we can't just jump into it. We can't say, hey, tomorrow, every trip you're making, you've got to tell me when you're leaving. What, and what are you doing when you're getting there? <laughs> and who are you seeing? What are you, what are you talking about? Yeah, that you, can't, you can't leap into that space, right? So I think you have, if you're trying to cultivate uh, an engaged, informed, non-adversarial set of system users, there are lots of people who share all sorts of stuff <laughs> on Facebook and everywhere else. I mean, there's some people that have the opposite of the privacy problem. They've got like the, ooh, I, here's my home address. I'm going to be in Mexico for four weeks. And come on over. Right? <laughs> there, there are lots of people for whom pri the privacy issues that they don't understand privacy at all. They're giving away too much information. So, so the point is that I think in this case, if we are trying to build a trust relationship with a set of connected consumers who are mobility consumers, then we want to extract from them as much information as we need without extracting too much. And we don't really know what that is yet. I think for, to find out what we really need to do to, to, to change our transit system around or to, to manage the, you know, the, 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 the signal rates or something or the fare rates or dynamic pricing, I think we need to know, understand more about those trips. And if we, if we do understand more about those trips, we can differentiate the getting to the hospital question versus the I hope to watch Batman today you know, kind of uh, differentiation among the, among the trips in the network. So I think, again, it's a shared resource. And so if we, if we can generate a community around the shared resource, and again, this is my kumbaya, another kumbaya moment, then I think we'll all know that, hey, <coughs> the system can react, and I can get to the hospital I need to. And maybe one day a month, I miss the start of Batman. I'm willing to make that trade off. I, and I understand that that's part of what the community is about. But if we don't have any, we don't really have the context to measure this longitudinally uh, and, and have that as part of the conversation in general. It's only, like you said, these very expensive surveys uh, that are limited. Uh, and, and, but I think if, if we had the capability to do that kind of survey or to generate that data as a routine part of our operations, how much more, how much more we learn about behavior, but number one, number one, but then uh, two, how can we like, transform how we manage the system, provide that mobility in a way that matters rather than just guessing at how it might matter. <coughs> last question, anyone? One last question. You mentioned Google um, earlier. Um, my question relates to balancing public interest with that of the private sector. Uh, Google owns Waze and one of their features is to let people know where speed traps are, for example. So in this connected, I guess in this connected system, how do we balance public interest versus private interest? How's that? Right on. So, so, so great point. And I, you know, I think we've been we were struggling with that issue for, for a long time. Um, I know there are a few people in the room who remember CB radios uh, from, the, from the 70s. There you go. And, you know, my, <laughs> that was essentially, but for the younger people in the audience, what would happen was you have this radio and you get on channel 19. And you listen, and they say, oh, well, there's Smokey Bear. It's at exit 15. And so you drive <laughs> like crazy until you get within two miles of exit 15. And then you creep along at, 15, at 55 miles an hour, because in the 70s, everything was 55 miles an hour. And then you could drive on. So, so people have been using, uh, so, so Google didn't invent uh, identifying the speed traps. You know, that, that, that's something that, as, a, as humans, we, we were absolutely doing for as long as we could. But I think it's an, it's an important point. Um, right on. So in this case, what I would say is that it's up to Google to decide what they put on that message, right? So I think it wouldn't be helpful, would be helpful for the government to say, you know, you can't put that information out there because it essentially is a situational awareness for uh, the rest of the community. I also am not a big fan of locational enforcement of, of speeds. And, you know, some cases speeds, well, I, I spent a lot of time driving in Germany where there are no speed limits on the Autobahn. And really, the, the issue isn't so much the speed, it's the variation in speed and how people are driving when things. So I think, uh, not to turn the, so I, you have an excellent question. I think we'll always wrestle with that. I don't have a pat answer for it. But I think the connected everything world, what are the truly unsafe driving behaviors that we want to curtail? I don't know that mainline open road maximum speed is always the most dangerous thing. I've been on the Autobahn, I've gone maybe 160 miles an hour, and there's nobody out there, and there are, you know, other people going 160 miles an hour with me. So it's, it's not like 
I was on the edge of my seat about to explode, and it was pretty cool. But it was, um, <laughs> but the, I don't know that that really feels like unsafe behavior. What I feel like is unsafe behavior is I'm on the beltway, and there's a guy reading a book <laughs> while he's driving. And, we're, and it's not like we're, you know, we're just sitting there. If we're just like totally, you know, jammed up, yeah, get out the book, <laughs> read your book. But if we're going 40, don't read the book. <laughs> and so, so I think there are, so if in the context of understanding what, so I think that's to be another awesome capability from a connected everything system is that we can be smarter about identifying the truly unsafe behaviors and target those things rather than arbitrary components. And I think they, they start now with the uh, unsafe driving, uh, imaging in and around the beltway. So if you're weaving around in traffic and driving on the shoulder, you know, and flipping people off, literally they can see it. And those are the people they, they target downstream to go be stopped for reckless driving. I think that, that is more dangerous than me going 85 on Highway 95 uh, when there's nobody else around. Well, thank you very much. Uh, oh. You are driving, so put this in a safe place in your car. Okay, thank you very much. <laughs> thank you very much. No reading. Mm. Yeah, well, no reading, yes. Yeah, well. <laughs> it is not a Eyes on the road, don't worry. <laughs> okay, uh, this has been terrific. Thank you for a very thoughtful conversation with us. Uh, this is my last item today for uh, the Transportation Founder Fund event. I would like to uh, we're a bit behind on making the announcement for the CE EDVIC Transportation Founders Fund Graduate Scholarship. Uh, some of you know that uh, this is offered through the Department of Civil Engineering for graduate students who are working toward a graduate degree in transportation and is funded through membership fees and contribution uh, and managed through the NC State Engineering Foundation. Uh, those of you who have gotten these may have seen in the back something about contribution to we always encourage you to support that cause and get the best students into our program. Uh, the uh, scholarship is named after Ed Vick, who was an original member of TFF and one of the first <coughs> member of the executive committee. Uh, t uh, in addition to his commitment to TFF, uh, Ed, who passed away in 2011, one of the first, one of the founders of Kimberly Horn and Associates. Uh, he was served as president from 1972 to 92, and then chairman before his retirement in 2001. Uh, Ed was a longtime member of our ITRI Advisory Council, uh, where he served until 2008. He was also an advocate for excellence in the transportation program and actually served in many leadership roles and boards at NC State. Uh, so uh, I would like to recognize the 2014, even though we are in 2015, uh, I want to recognize Andy Wagner. Andy, would you please step forward? And I would like to invite Stacy Phillips, uh, who is from Kimberly Horn and would represent uh, the Edvick uh, family. Uh, Andy completed his bachelor degree in civil engineering here at NC State last year. He graduated valedictorian, Kuma Sumlada with a 4.0 GPA. I don't know how many of you can match that. <laughs> uh, and then on the way, he also finished a minor in mathematics. Uh, he's currently pursuing a master's degree in transportation, uh, doing research on validating travel time reliability prediction model using a grant from the National Transportation Center in Maryland. Uh, Andy was a 2014 fellow. He won the 2014 CE Department Award for Leadership. And while an undergraduate served on the Chancellor Aid Program, uh, basically representing the university by welcoming guests and providing assistance. He was also awarded the Malky General Hugh Shelton Leadership Award for 20, in 2013. And this award is given to a senior in civil engineering at NC State who exhibits value-based leadership quality. So uh, congratulations, Andy. 
And on behalf of the TFF Executive Committee, I am pleased to offer you the scholarship of $3,000. Well, again, I want to thank you all for staying with us. We're a little bit behind time, but I'm delighted with the turnout. And thank you, Carl, again for an excellent presentation. The meeting is adjourned.